Hey, hey, hey. Hey, I think we came on at the same time. I don't know if that's ever happened before. Dude, we were hot tonight, man. Wow. We were hot. And that was without even any uh, pre q any. Yeah, we got no production help. We're not on the phone telling each other when to go. We we just we're just good, baby. Just go time. That's it. Welcome to the Hangout Live here with Drake and Robbie Lochner. We are grateful to be back again this week here on Facebook on the Hangout Live station. Now, Robbie, we got to talk about some sponsors, bro. All right. All right. Let's get it in here. Media Jaw. Jody Gentry and his team are taking care of us. You can go to the hangout.live, www.thehangout.live. Check out all the past performances, past shows. We got the Who's Coming Ups. So we've got a link so you can buy some gear and get some Hangout gear. It's, it's pretty awesome, man. So go over and check it out. And then we've got our favorite people in the world, Backbeat Music Company. Alexander and the crew over there, we can't do it without you guys. And then, of course, ah, we've got our wine sponsors, bro. You know what? Brad, I just put the, I put the bottle on the other side. Did you? Oops. Brad and Here's Kim a Benice. We love you. Thank you very much. And cheers Glass to everybody out there. Lots of wine a week to keep the doctor in, yeah, whatever. Heart pumping better, right? Yes, keep the heart pumping better. <laughs> All right. So obviously I'm sporting the hat from Stuart Marriott, part of the Broken Arrow for Peace. And uh, support that, Barrier Inner Weapons for Peace. It's a fantastic organization. Check them out if you if you don't know what I'm talking about. You can look them up on uh, Barrier Inner Weapon for Peace. Let's see it. So we got some scary news happening in Texas and the South right now with these two tropical storms merging together to form one massive hurricane. Um, people down in Galveston are being evacuated right now, Houston, and um, they're bracing for impact down there. So obviously our thoughts and prayers uh, go out to you. You think maybe if they got together, they could cancel each other out if they're spinning the opposite way, but maybe not. I got my friend Eric Christensen and his family live down there. I'll have to give him a call and see. Uh, of course, he's probably on the road uh, heading out, fucking out, right. if they told him to evacuate. So. Yeah, we had a small little tornado here over the weekend, and the weather here has been crazy, man. But house right across the street ripped the roof sure off of it. We just uh, we we got lucky, thank God. So our hearts and prayers go out to Houston, Galveston, Louisiana, all of the people down there in the South. All right, last but not least, let's talk about the Hangout shirts. If you haven't got yours yet, we are just about run out of it. So you can get your Hangout Live shirts from... Uh, me, send a comment in the, the messages below and we'll get you taken care of. And of course you get that autograph show photo of Robbie Lochner and myself, so. Did you show the backbeat stuff? I did. You did? I oh, did. wow. See, I'm I already cruising. forgot, that's not good. <laughs> I'm cruising. <laughs> All right, man, so we got Henry Cho, actor, comedian, joining us tonight. Obviously you guys know who he is. He's the funny man himself. I say we bring him in. Bring him in. Let's bring him in. My wow. brother. How are you? Good. How Good. you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. Henry, thank you so much for joining us on the Hangout Live demand tonight, man. We appreciate you more than you know. Oh, sure, Drake. Happy to do it, man. Thanks, brother. So we kind of got in touch to with each other through Morgan Miles, Robbie. I don't know if you remember this. Yeah. Morgan Miles' representation actually is the same representation for Henry, and we kind of got linked that way. And I'm I'm super grateful for her getting involved and getting us getting us in touch with each other. Yeah, it's yeah. great. I mean, she's been doing great. You know, I just it's all new. She and I was it's a whole new uh, adventure we're on. So uh, I'm I'm looking forward to the future with her and the couple. And it actually started because I reached out to her and I was like, "Do you have any uh, comedians on on your list on your roster?" Because we were trying to put together a show here and have a comedian and a country artist. Right. And that's where your name came up. So obviously then COVID set in and everything kind of got defunct. But as soon as it's over, you and I are going to be partying together here in San Angelo, my brother. Oh, you got it, man. That'd be great. I do a lot of shows with country guys, so it's good. <laughs> All right. It'd be fun. So, yeah. Henry, your your niche is very special in, in entertainment. And, and, and people know you. Obviously, you, you've got some it's South Korean descent, correct? Yes, my parents uh, immigrated from Seoul 70 years ago. 
70 years, 70 years ago. ago. Yes. So, but you were born and raised in Knoxville, Tennessee. Yes, sir. So, you know, that's what I always say, you know, I'm full blood Korean, but I was born and raised in Knoxville. So I'm South Korean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm the only guy. I'm the only guy on the planet can do that joke. So there you go. It wouldn't work for me, brother. <laughs> no, it wouldn't. It so, definitely would. So growing up in Knoxville, what was that like, buddy? Well, you know, I tell you, it was actually great. You know, my, my jokes, uh, but that's not funny. So <laughs> I always, uh, you know, I tell you, I will tell you this, and it's a true story. Uh, I was the only Asian kid from pre-K till I graduated high school. So I had no idea I was supposed to be smart. <laughs> no, I, I, I didn't know. I didn't know there was some <laughs> stereotype that were smart, which is not a bad stereotype. Right. So it, wasn't, it wasn't until I was in college and uh, people would like try to look at my papers and stuff. <laughs> We'd have a pop quiz and they'd look at me and they go, uh, man, you're not smart. <laughs> and I'm like, well, I was born here. <laughs> So, no expectations on being a doctor or, you know, tech. Oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. My parents were, uh, they immigrated from Korea. So, I was supposed to be a doctor or play the cello. And uh, right. I tell jokes in bars. So, it didn't really work out for them. Doctor to playing the cello. How do those correlate, brother? Well, they're both uh, pretty significant in the, uh, what you know, because if you look at a lot of Asian people, they're either very great in the arts right like playing the cello or violin or what have you or they're the ones you go to when you're sick so right well i, I will admit my my doctor's name is dr chang so i mean i'm, I'm there and, and right and that's what you would want you want to absolutely that's exactly what you want <laughs> absolutely brother so you grew up was your family in the arts i mean where did comedy were you the quiet kid in class or were you the filibuster i mean no, no, no. You know, here's the crazy thing. I wasn't a, uh, I wasn't the class clown, but my buddies throughout the years, they've, you know, we've always discussed this now. And they're like, yeah, but you, you, you always laid back and you listened. And then when you would say something, it was over. Whatever you would throw in, no one could top it. So it was over. So you always had that. But I never performed. I never had any of that. I just, I tried comedy when I was in college and it worked. So that's, that's why we're talking now. Yeah, right. I mean, the legend goes you actually walked into a uh, competition, never having been on stage before, and won the competition. Is that that's right, right? That is right. I, here's the crazy thing. So my buddies go, "What do you really want to do?" And I said, "You know, I think I'm going to try stand up, get into acting." And they're like, "Well, you're not funny." And I go, "Well, I know, <laughs> but I think I can do it." And they're like, "Well, yeah, that having a little confidence ne never been your problem." So. <laughs> I signed up for this comedy competition at the uh, Funny Bone Comedy Club in Knoxville. So I was number 13. They were only taking 12. So I was the first alternate. So Friday, I get a call and they said, hey, somebody dropped out. You're in. Be here Monday night, 7 o'clock. I said, all right. So me and my buddies are driving in my truck. Thank God I had enough gas to get there. And on the way there, they're like going, my two college roommates, they're like, you really doing this? I said, yeah. They go, all right, well, if you're going to do it. Talk about this, talk about that, tell this story, tell that story. So we get there, and I thought it was 12 guys like me who had never done it before. But it was a funniest person in Tennessee competition, and they were like working comedians doing it. So I saw the first few guys go up, and I told my buddies, all right, I'm just going to try it since we're here, and I'll never talk about doing this again. Never. But I'm just going to go up and do it since we're here. So I went on fifth and I destroyed. I got a standing ovation and I won. And I walked off stage and Jerry Kubach, who owned the Funny Bone chain back then, there were 12 clubs in the country. And uh, he said, how long have you been doing comedy? And I said, uh, right there, that was it. He goes, no way. And my buddy's like, yeah, I swear, that was the first time. And he said, you want to start working this week? I said, what do you mean? He goes, I need an MC, work Wednesday through Sunday. Uh, I said, sure. So I uh, went on stage on Monday. I got hired. I started working on Wednesday and I dropped out of college on Friday 
and that was over 34 years ago. Wow. Wow. Now, yeah. you, you told me in the pre-show that you went to college for six years. Yeah, you didn't have to tell that to everybody, but yeah. <laughs> no, all I heard was you did six spring breaks. That's what I heard. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's what it was. That's so what I'm it not was. stupid. I'm not stupid. <laughs> I thought we were having a rendition of Tommy Boy here. A lot of people go to college for eight years. <laughs> yeah. No, six six years I did, and, uh, you know, I had a bad advisor. What can I say? <laughs> right? Well, they didn't point you in the right direction. Comedy was definitely it for you. Yeah, so, it worked out. So I started, I started lightning fast, but I, I did any show there was to do. I could get on stage. I was, I worked everywhere. I mean, I in the old days, I, I did fifty weeks a year. The first year I did comedy, and wow. I would do, yeah. So and I, there's a, a comedy team called Zach and Mac, and they they both passed away. And Zach and Mac, two huge African American guys. One of my first road gigs, uh, they took me to uh, East St. Louis, and I did a show at Maurice's, and the show didn't start till midnight. And uh, then they had this thing, it was called the Chitlin Tour, and it was all black clubs, and all the shows didn't start till midnight or one, so I did that with them. I was the only non-African American in every room we went to uh, throughout, we did, yeah, I mean, we did Detroit, we did chicago we did st louis we did kansas city it, we went everywhere wow and it, how did you do did you, you obviously you went over pretty well right uh yeah you know it worked you know it wasn't the greatest and and uh but they took me with them and uh they introduced me they'd say hey give this guy your respect he's brand new but he's gonna go places so uh we brought him out with us and so with their blessing it went well i i wouldn't dare try to just crack my way into there on my own but yeah but you know it was a different thing and that's how I got my uh, stand-up chops by doing all these gigs I did a bunch of gigs in the south that had chicken wire just like in roadhouse and all those things so wow. really yes that is uh, I opened a D Fords in Anniston Alabama and they had a set of rules on the door as you walked in and rule number four was no firearms allowed indoors that was rule number four. Number four, firearms. Yeah, yeah. Number four, indoors, indoors. That, I don't know if the chicken funny. wire would do much good on that, on the firearms. So, yeah, no, probably. They, <laughs> they wouldn't. And I was so, the only, in those shows, I was the only non-Caucasian in the joint. Right. <laughs> now, were people actually throwing stuff at comedians? I guess they would, huh? That's why they had them there. The yeah, wire. I think it was more for the bands. Oh, Okay. Because, uh, but I do know some kids. So it became this uh, tour called the Creative Entertainment. So I did hear some stories of some of my buddies going up there, and uh, you know, people were throwing empty bottles, just kind of freak them out. And uh, they, it wasn't so much that they didn't like him; it was just it's there, so why not? Why not do it? Yeah. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So somewhere in the eighties, eighty nine ish, you moved out to L.A. Is that correct? Yeah, I uh, started comedy in '86. Uh, Bill Ingvall, uh, dear friend of mine, was already living there. So he said, "Hey, come on out and visit, and uh, I'll, we'll do some spots." So I did a spot at the Ice House, and I got hired. I got a, I got a job offer to be the warm up guy for uh, Robert Guillaume's show. Uh, he played Benson. In, yeah. In soap. Oh yeah. So, but I wasn't living. I said, "I don't live here." And uh, the producer goes, man, you got to move here. So I talked to some other guys and uh, I ended up signing with uh, Ingvall's manager. And at the time he had Bill Ingvall, Rosie O'Donnell and me. So I moved to L.A. and uh, uh, it, it went great. I mean, I had a great time and uh, things were going fantastic. And, you know, at, at one point uh, I was there from 89 to 94, the first stretch. And, uh, you know, L.A. was just kind of making me somebody I, I, I didn't really like. So right. uh, I thought, man, I got to get out of this town. And it just so happened all my pals and peers were going to New York because they all signed on with Saturday Night Live. So I figured it's a good time for me to split. And uh, I bought a farm outside of Nashville and moved. And then I commuted every week for two years to host Friday Night Videos in L.A every week for two years back and forth every week they would fly an NBC travel card and I would 
fly from Nashville to LA on Wednesday and we taped the show Wednesday night right after the tonight show. And then if I had gigs, I'd go do my gigs. And if not, I'd fly back here Thursday or Friday. I did it every week for two, uh, two years. Wow. So the pals that left and went to New York, you're talking about like Adam Sandler and Adam Sandler, David Spade, uh, Rob Schneider, uh, Chris Rock wasn't around yet. Um, but, uh, you know, and those guys are in New York. I mean, they're on Saturday Night Live. Now, they weren't big feature performers at the time. Right. And, and we'd still tour together just to have fun. But they're opening for me. And they're on Saturday Night Live. Wow. Because <laughs> that's how we did it. I mean, that's just how we did it. The coolest thing was back in the good old days, uh, Judd Apatow, me, Spade, Sandler, Rob, if it was one of our birthdays, we would go to every club in L.A. And if it was your birthday, you had to go on stage, but you couldn't do your material. You had to do one, some of ours. So oh, wow. nothing funnier than seeing Adam Sandler go on stage saying he's uh, he's from Knoxville, but he's Korean. <laughs> <laughs> so... Any wow, backstage funny. hijinks you can tell us about? Because I know I had to get rowdy backstage with you guys. Uh, you know, it, we had fun. I mean, because we had fun. And, and when you're doing shows like the Comedy Magic Club in Hermosa Beach was a great club. Oh, Still yeah. is. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, you, every once in a while you're doing show after show after show, you just want to do something different. So, you know, one time the house MC there had a beard and uh, he was going to shave it. And I said, whoa, whoa. Take off a little bit and see if in, when the next guy went up and he took a razor and took two sides out. And then he had mutton chops and a Fu Manchu. Then he had a goatee. Then he had a mustache. And at the very end, he had a Hitler mustache. And he oh, goes, shit. Good night. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Just, man, stuff it, like that it must have been a blast at the heydays back then and and stuff before you guys got to that point in your careers where you know the fandom and the, and the the celebrityism really kind of took off it it, it, it was so much fun. good it was must fun and clubs clubs were packed and the climate was different you could say you know Stand-up comedy is the last bastion of free speech. Yep, right. and, and it was, and it was so much easier then. And, uh, it, yeah, it was a blast. I mean, we, yeah. we used to have so much fun. I mean, we'd do spots. Where I, we'd sit around at the improv, and we'd look at the list. And this is when we all first got there. So we were all the alternates. And we'd sit there, and on the list is Leno and Seinfeld and – Kerry Shanling and Bill Maher, all these guys. And we we're just hoping one of them wouldn't show up so we could go on. And it'd get really close to the time when one of them was supposed to be there and we'd go, hey, looking good, looking good. Ah, there he is. You know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> right. But, you know, that's who we learned from. We learned watching the best and uh, and uh, they just passed on their, their knowledge to us. And hopefully we've done that throughout the years to other guys. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So when when did acting come into play? I mean, because you've you've been in a in a few movies yourself, Revenge of the Nerds three. Um, I'll, I'm a kind of a nerd fan, so don't yeah. hate me on that one. No, no, no. Uh oh, what happened? Oh, look at that. Look at you guys right there, brother. Yeah, that was our take on Beverly Hills 90210. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> makes sense now. <laughs> so hey, 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 put can you put that back up? Absolutely. Absolutely. Give me just a moment here. Yeah. So there we go. So on the uh, the guy whose head's next to my head, that's John Panette, stand-up comedian who's yep. no longer with us. Yes. And and the guy in the top right, uh, that's Grant Heslov. He uh, he won an Academy Award with George Clooney for screenwriting. And really? he was also he was also the camera guy in True Lies. Oh wow! Nice. nice. 
And then the guy in the uh, kind of rainbow shirt whose head's on my lap, that's uh, Greg, Bink Greg Binkley. He was in uh, Saving Hope. And then the guy, the black guy with the Malcolm X hat, that's Sean McBride. He's done everything. Right. So that time, that was like being at uh, on a college campus, all of us together. That was so much fun. Still keep in touch with uh, a lot of those guys. And uh, yeah, that was 1989, 90 maybe. And right. I just, I just moved to town and I just, uh, I did a guest star on designing women and then got into that. So it happened because uh, I was doing spots uh, as you know, the comedian, Larry Miller, you know, Larry Miller. I do. Yeah. Okay. So Absolutely. Larry got the role as the uh, sales clerk in pretty woman with Julie right. Roberts and Richard Gere. When he says, you're not only handsome, you're, you're a fine looking man, you know, that guy. Right. Yeah. So people say, how'd you get that? He goes, well, I was doing my job. I was on stage <laughs> doing my spots. And fortunately, the casting lady was doing her job. She was at the club looking for people like me because if neither of us did the job that night, I wouldn't have gotten that role. Had she had a headache or another plans or decided not to go to the improv. And if I didn't feel like going because I've been up on stage five nights in a row, I would have never gotten a job. So I was doing my job. I, I, I made myself visible. Right. I was doing my sets. I was doing my spots. And uh, people noticed me. <clears throat> so the Nerds movie, ironically, the character was supposed to be a overweight uh, samurai broken English guy. And they couldn't find who they wanted. So the director and producers contacted my agent and said, hey, Steve Henry will even come in and talk to us. So I went in and I said, look, I don't do broken English, so I'm not doing that. And they right. said, well, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. Give me. Give me two days, I'll come in with something else. So I walked in as Elvis. And uh, as I did it, the director goes, oh, I see it. Da -da 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 -da. I see it. You got it, buddy. So they gave Good. me the role. Yep. And we had to rewrite every line, which I helped, because I just riff it. And they go, oh, that's, that, that'll work. Really? Yeah, that's great. That's I mean, cool. they had their set lines, but all the other stuff, I, I just threw in there. Nice. So back in the day, you used to give Robbie kind of a run for the uh, the beautiful haircut there, brother. Look at this. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So that's uh, my wife and I are on our honeymoon, and at our wedding, we had to we had to flip a coin to see who got to had to wear their hair up or down. <laughs> <laughs> that's some good looking locks, brother. <laughs> yeah, and I did that for uh, several years actually. Did you? Yeah, and then. Uh, when my oldest kid, I took him for his first haircut. He was like two or three. He goes, how come you're not getting your hair cut? <laughs> and my hair was that long. I said, you know what, buddy? I'll cut it right now. So <laughs> we, yeah, so we cut it and we actually donated it. And uh, they made wigs out of it. So it's all good. Awesome. I think I got a picture with you and your kiddos here, right here, actually. Yeah, that's in Honduras. Uh, we go to Honduras every spring break on a mission trip. Nice. And there's an orphanage there my church started called Hovenus in Camino, which actually I played in the charity golf tournament today for that. And oh, cool. that is in a village called Mirador. And uh, we are building a structure uh, beside that center block stuff. And the one we're building is good. So that's when my daughter is like five. And then my sons are, uh, let me get this straight. Yeah, they're like 10, 8, and 5. 10, 8, and 5. You got a beautiful family, sir. Thank you. Yeah, they're good yes. kids. So tell us more about these mission trips that you go on. Uh, it started our church here in Nashville, Brentwood, Tennessee, uh, very active in domestic and global missions. And um uh, so I went to Honduras first with just a bunch of guys and we built a house, which is, it's not, it's a 16 by 16 shed, no power, no water. And the people we built it for, the, the grace and the uh, respect they have just to have a structure. I mean, it could be 
the Taj Mahal. It's the Taj Mahal to them. Uh, the first house we ever built was for a young lady who was 20 and her daughter was three and her daughter had never slept uh, with a roof over her head. Wow. The night before we finished the house, they slept on the dirt with a tarp. Wow. And, uh, you know, she, she was just crying when she got in this shed that we would put our lawnmowers in. So then I went back a few more times with my buddies. And then finally, when my kids got old enough to go, we started taking them because I wanted them to get exposed to all that. And then the orphanage has 60 boys. And so my boys, you know, fit right in with them. They play soccer and all this stuff. And so we go there every year. And unfortunately, uh, we, we couldn't go in 18 or 19. So then we were going this March and COVID came. So we had to cancel our trip two days before we were leaving. And it sounds like an absolutely beautiful, beautiful experience. And, and what a it's, un it's unbelievable. And, and Tegucigalpa, the, uh, the capital of Honduras is super crazy, uh, uh, dangerous. And right. the orphanage thankfully is about 45 minutes, about uh, 30 kilometers away. And, uh, in a really nice, uh, country setting and but you know my boys have seen a lot of stuff in Tegucigalpa that you know and, and there's one village we were building uh, a house we had six guys with machetes up on the hill and Grant my middle kid looked at me looked at man he looked at me and goes that's our security I go yep that's security those are local village guys gonna keep the bad guys away from us and they had machetes and there were six of them that's insane. We went to, uh, not any comparison at all, but we went to Isla Roatan there down by Honduras. Yeah, and that's sweet. Yeah, and we were fell in love with it. And we started like really kind of thinking about moving and what it would be like to relocate there. And then we brought up Honduras and it said the murder murder capital of the world. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 If you have ever had to go anywhere else, you'd be in trouble. I mean, it's, it's, it's a, I'll never get one of the first trips that my family was on. They're all on the bus and I always rented a truck. And so two cars in front of me, I was, I was in front of the bus, two cars in front of me, a truck popped open. A guy jumped out, had his hands tied behind his back and four guys with guns took off running after him. And they just left the car there and he ran toward the mall parking lot where we were going. Wow. And so I start signaling the bus driver and I make a U-turn and my boys go, where are we going? I go, ah, we're not going to the mall right now. We're going to go somewhere else. Right. <laughs> That's yeah. crazy. Mall's, mall's going to wait. We're going to wait on the mall. We'll take a little break. <laughs> yeah. We, yeah. We've got our producer, Jessica, wants to come in and ask a couple questions from the audience and give us just a moment. Let's bring her in. Cool. Hi, hey, Jess. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. How are you? I'm pretty good. How are you? I was enjoying your stories and hearing about Honduras. That's a really wonderful thing you guys do. Oh, well, thanks. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, we're the lucky ones. Yeah, so nice. Um, well, I have some questions from um, the audience. Um, the first question comes from Brenda. She would like to know who makes you laugh, really laugh? Oh, wow. Uh, besides my family, because my kids are innately funny and my wife is hilarious. Uh, professionally, Eddie Izzard makes me laugh. Uh, Brian Regan, good pal of mine. If we play golf or something, he just makes me laugh. Oh, great. That's good. Um, another question comes from Jennifer. She wants to know, how did you end up meeting some country greats like Vince Gill and Reba, Carrie Underwood, and Amy Grant? Uh, okay, well, Reba came about because I toured with her. So she hired me to go out with her. We did, I mean, I, I toured with her probably 50 shows throughout the years, if not more. And then I met Vince playing golf. I, uh, he and I were doing the Tonight Show together. I didn't know him from Adam. And I said, hey, I just bought a farm outside of Nashville uh, where should I play golf? And he said, he told me the place and he said, you need a couple of letters to, uh, to get in the membership. He goes, Reba's a member and I'll write a letter. <laughs> so the guy called me and goes, Oh, you got a couple good letters. So you're in. Yeah. So then nice. Vince, yeah. So Vince and I start <laughs> playing golf 
And uh, my goodness, that was 25, 28 years ago. And we play, we still play, we played last week. So Vince and I from golf. Uh, Carrie, I met when she won uh, American Idol. We were both with CAA at the time. And they did not want a music act to open for her because they didn't want her to have the pressure to follow music. Mm-hmm. So they asked if I would go and I said, sure. And it was actually my teeny bopper year. I opened for Carrie Underwood, Leanne Rimes, and I did a Hillary Duff movie. Wow. <laughs> nice. Wow. But so I toured, I toured with Carrie and uh, we just spent a lot of time hanging out because she was brand new. And then uh, she ended up marrying Mike Fisher uh, who played hockey for the Predators, who happened to be a really good friend of mine. So I still see them a lot. Matter, and uh, matter of fact, Mike and I played uh, Wednesday. Uh, he plays golf also with us. And uh, who was the other one? Um, Amy Grant. Oh, Amy Grant. I knew Amy before Vince. I tell him that all the time. <laughs> uh, Amy and I, Amy had me uh, do some shows with her uh, around town. I was actually in L.A., but she had some shows and I did them and she and I have just been uh, just dear pals forever. And, you know, I did the Christmas tour. She asked me to do a Christmas tour with she and Vince back in uh, mid two thousands. And uh, that was the greatest thing. Cause you know, I grew up listening to Amy Grant. I'm from Knoxville. I mean, tender Tennessee Christmas, get out. And I've sat on a stool two feet from her while she's, you know, performed it. It's been amazing. But I tell my buddies who have still, you know, fantasize about Amy Grant, <laughs> that, the, that she would wake me up every morning on the bus and just go, hey, Henry, coffee's ready. And I'd, <laughs> I'd, I'd text one of my buddies going, so uh, Amy Grant just told me my coffee's ready. She's making coffee for me. <laughs> Lucky guy. <laughs> yeah. Wow. I, I had a no, huge crush Grant. on Amy Grant. Mm-hmm. Yeah, who died? Right. <laughs> yeah. No, great yeah, people. He, right. You got any more right now, Jess? Um, yeah, we have another question. Um, actually, sure. from Brenda, the same person. Um, she was wondering if uh, being a clean comedian brings any challenges. Uh, yeah, you know, early early on, it definitely did. You know, uh, we were talking earlier about me doing all these venues that weren't the greatest situations for stand up comedy, and you know, if I I really wanted to cuss a lot of people out from the stage but I always stuck to my guns because that's not who I am and I knew if I ever faltered then I wouldn't be successful uh and so I just stuck to who I am and I, I did a clean show no matter what the situation was and I've always done clean comedy you know it's adult humor it's just clean yeah and uh early in my career six eight months in my career I got to work with Jerry Seinfeld and Seinfeld said, so you're clean. That's smart because I've never understood why a comedian would work on a joke for 10 years and never get to do it on television. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. And that was back when there were three stations, three networks, four when Fox came around. Fox came around. Yep. Right. Yep. That's crazy. Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Henry. Hey, thank you. Great meeting you on, on you know, you. virtually. <laughs> <laughs> Now, it's interesting about, you know, a comedian's opening for um, artists because a lot of people go, oh, they don't really think about it. But it's been going on. I mean, Cheech and Chong used to do it way back in, you know, what, uh, 70s. They opened at the California World Music Festival. They opened that up. Van Halen was on the bill. Ted Nugent was on the bill. And Cheech and Chong opened the show. I was there. Cheech and Chong. Yeah. Cheech and Chong. You were there, right? (laughs) I was there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's It's cool. I mean, it's, it's different, you know. It's totally different, and you're just a buffer, you know. When I used to open up for Reba, you know, I did the tour. It was me, Brooks and Dunn, and Reba. But Reba figured out that if she had me, I would go up, uh, and behind me is a silk screen, and Brooks and Dunn are already set up. And when I'd finish my set, whether it be 10 minutes or 15 minutes or however long, I'd go, thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen, Brooks and Dunn curtain up bam so she didn't have to wait for an extra breakdown and setup so exactly the show moves quicker she's done earlier and that's that's what she figured out and so it doesn't always work great for as far as a comedian because 
we did a lot of outdoor things and you know the laughs go straight up to the sky it's a totally different thing for a yeah. comedian to be outdoors but uh but yeah it it's it's it is a it's always it's been going on for a long time like you just said yeah it has been and, and you're right when it's outdoors like those big shows sometimes it's a little tougher to kind of get some of that something about it with the outdoors it's just harder to kind of uh, you know get the jokes it's just a but it's cool, though. Like you said, as a musician, I understand it. You're set up. The curtain's there. It's easy. As soon as they're done, there's no changeover. None. Like, <laughs> boom, walk out, and you're on. You know, so right. it's cool. It's a good idea. And, and I always had to have the attitude going in, you know, they're not there to see me. I'm just I'm, – I'm killing time. I would tell people, look at your ticket. What does it say? <laughs> yeah. It says, it says uh, $62.10. I'm the 10 cents. <laughs> 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 so uh we had another question just come in from kim van Nees, and they wanted to know if you had any relation to the comedian margaret show uh no and my sisters would kill you for asking right <laughs> <laughs> no i've known margaret forever she used to open for me uh back when she first started and uh she's done well in her own niche but no we are we just have the same last name. Now she did start her career telling everybody she was my sister. So oh. I've always had, I've had to get, uh, there's been a lot of people asking that question. So you talked about briefly about the movie you did with Hillary Duff, but you've had quite a few appearances on a, a lot of different shows. You've got Arsenio Hall that you did back that, in the day. Oh man, that was so much fun. That was, that was the good old days, man doing yeah. Arsenio because you never knew who was going to be backstage afterwards and we'd all go run around and I'll, I'll never forget I was doing a set at Arsenio and I did a joke and it got instead of getting a hundred percent like I was used to it got about 80 percent which was still good right and I hear a voice to my right going that always does better than that and I look over and it's Chris Rock and he starts heckling me as I'm doing my set <laughs> So it was, it was, I was uh, every time I would tell a joke, he goes, "That wouldn't work." Oh, that okay. That he's back on track, everybody. <laughs> Just stuff like that. I did one joke that got eighty instead of a hundred, and he's he's heckling me. It was hilarious. He wasn't even on the show. He's just hanging out. Just hanging out. <laughs> just hanging out. Now you you were on a show. What one of my icons and treasures of the United States, Bob Hope. You did. Oh the man. So I've asked for one autograph in my life. And I've taken one showbiz picture in my life, and that was Bob Hope. And I wasn't even going to get his autograph, but we had a script, and all the other comedians got there, got his autograph. And finally, he goes, "Hey, Hank, you can come over here." And I said, "Man, I don't, I don't really ask for autographs." He goes, "Then don't ask. But if you want it, I'm more than willing." And my buddy looked at me and goes, "If you're going to get one, that's the that's one." The one. So. Cool thing is we're doing a press junket at his house and he's got a 90 yard par three behind his house in his backyard. Wow. And he goes, uh, we're taking a break and he walked through with some wedges. He goes, Hey, Hank, come on. I was like, cool. And somebody else goes, Hey, can I go? I play golf. And Mr. Hope goes, see, that's the difference. You play golf. Hank is a golfer. <laughs> Ooh, <laughs> it was the greatest. <laughs> it was the greatest. Hank is a golfer. So we went out there for about 15 minutes and hit balls. And that was the greatest. That that, wow. that was the greatest. Just that, hang out. That's wow. exceptional. Yeah. Exceptional. That was I got great. goosebumps off of that one, brother. Yeah, man. That was the coolest. He was he was asking me about comedy nowadays. And then he goes, forget all that. How do you hit that shot you just hit? So then I was showing him. <laughs> I was showing him a little way to turn his uh, grip a little differently. And he was going, man, you, you can play. I go, yeah, I'll play a little bit. So, so what, what year was that? What year was that? 92. 92. I believe that was 1992, I think. That's, that's what I've got is 92. So I love golf. I just, I'm horrible at it. I love to go out and play it, but I, I go 300 yards in every direction, but the direction I try to hit in. Well, then you need to aim in some other direction. Yeah, that's why I play miniature golf. I stick to that. <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> and he yeah, still stick, can't hit the green. Oh, stick to what you know. <laughs> hey, I beat my my 11 year old daughter. Well, last time we played, so. <laughs> hey, that's a goal right there. <laughs> I'm telling you. So you did the first half hour on MTV's half hour comedy special. We spoke about that. VH1 stand up spotlight. You were on that as well. Yeah, man, you're pulling out the, all the great old ones. Yeah. Right. VH1 or MTV, brother? You have to choose now. Uh, v, uh, MTV back then. Back then. Okay. All right. VH1 today. Uh, I'm a CMT guy, but yeah. Me too. Uh -huh. I, I'm a GAC CMT guy. There you go. There you go. All right. GAC. What, what is GAC? Great American country. It's here in Nashville. That it, it, it's not around anymore. Oh, okay. All right. So you're a country guy. I, I, I can appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, I listen to everything though. I mean, if you look at my playlist, I got the uh, ACDC and I got George Strait. So, you know, so wait a minute, so spent. MTV, you aren't doing the MTV thing. I mean, back in the day, and that's pretty cool, right? Oh, it was it was the coolest back then. I mean, yeah. there, there's a guy named Jordan Brady. Uh, he used to talk about the, mu mu the music you hear in adult films. It's that bong, chicka, bong, bong. Yeah. So that's his joke. That's that's the guy. And after he did his set, he was he goes, he says something like, you will not believe what backstage looks like here at the first MTV deal. And he pulled up his laminate and he goes, boom, chicka, boom, boom. <laughs> it's the greatest. It's the greatest. <laughs> I bet it got pretty wild back then, man, for sure. It was, was nice. When, when MTV was like, you know, had actually had music television was part of the thing, right? right. And they yeah, mixed they it up have, with all these like, goofy game shows. It was just yeah. music television and uh, you know, one of the coolest gigs I did, 1987. So I've been doing comedy um, a, a little over a year. And uh, I got hired by MTV to be the backup opener on spring break in Daytona. Wow. So I called all my boys wow. in Knoxville and I said, get to Daytona because I have a limo that says MTV on it. Oh, shit. <laughs> wow. Cool yeah. And, and that was back up. Uh, Wang Chung and Flock of Seagulls were the big headliners. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. Wow. So uh, there must be some good stories to go along with that that you probably can't tell. <laughs> that, that, was, that, that was a good time. I was 25. Yeah. Yeah, 25. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Wang Chung, first concert I ever went to. Wang Chung. And the crazy thing is, so I never had to work. That was the other great thing. I never had to go. I just hung out with Justine Bateman the whole time. Oh, well. she, no, was there for some, she was there for some reason. But, uh, <laughs> and remember uh, Larry Bud Melvin from the uh, David Letterman show? Larry Bud, the yeah. short, old guy? Short guy glasses. Yeah. Yeah. So he was there. And so one time uh, there was some technical difficulty going on right before uh, Wang Chung. So they said, Henry, why don't you run out and do like uh, a minute or two? I said, okay. And Larry Bud goes, let me go. I said, go. So he ran out and we're in Daytona and he walks out and goes, hello, Fort Lauderdale. Oh, and that was it. And that was it. <laughs> that's all he did. <laughs> and so he came back and he goes, he goes, were you okay with that? I go, yeah, man, I didn't want to go out there. You're fine. <laughs> You're being tortured hanging out with Justine Bateman. Yes. So that was back when Martha Quinn and uh, Martha Quinn was there. Adam, Adam uh, was it Curry? Curry? Yeah. Yeah. All the, the main VJs. The first that ones. Was back then. Yeah. yeah. Wow. How fun that was, cool. was that? That was that the was heyday. Cool. That was really the heyday. They had the Headbangers Ball. They had, you know, it was, you know, MTV was something at that time. Oh, it was so, it was, uh, it was iconic. I mean, it yeah. was, the, it was the thing. Yeah. Right. Mikhail's wow. Navy. Mikhail's Navy, the movie, uh, David Allen Greer, Tom Arnold, me and Bruce, Bruce Campbell. Uh, we shot that in Mexico. It was like being at camp for, uh, it was unbelievable. It was like being at camp for three months. And uh, we, we had a great access to a golf course. 
So Brian Spice was the director. And so we'd do a main shot and I'd be in it and I'd look at the DOP, director of photography, and I'd say, am I, when we turn around, am I in the shot? He goes, yeah, if you take one step left, you're out. So I take a step left and the director goes, you're the only actor I know who doesn't want to be in the scene so you can go play golf. I go, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'd shoot the main shot and when they turned it around, I would, I would be in the background because I'd be off the set. <laughs> when, when did you start, first start playing golf? Uh, you, when I started doing comedy. Uh, you know, I tried to play when I was in high school and college. I just couldn't afford it. Right. And uh, so when I first started doing comedy, I, you know, I got, here, here's the great thing about comedy. I have 23 hours a day to kill. So yeah. I bought some cheap, I bought some clubs and I played all these, you know, municipal courses, which I still love. And then as my comedy profile went up, so did the places I play golf. Right. Uh, got more exclusive. And so I've, I've been blessed enough to play golf in 50 states. and. Uh, I play all the time. Matter of fact, I'm leaving as soon as we're done. I'm headed to uh, outside of Evansville, Indiana, to play in the uh, Corn Ferry Tour Championship Pro Am tomorrow. I tee off at 8 a.m. Wow! Is that going to be televised? No, 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 no. This no? is the Pro Am. So okay. I, I, it'll, yeah, it's at Victoria National, which is one of the phenomenal golf courses in our country. It's one of the hardest courses, but I play in this every year. So. Matter of yeah. fact, me and uh, Vince Gill and I did the very first uh, parents party they had probably 10 years ago. Nice, brother. If, if I shoot under 110, I'm happy. Yeah. Well, you know, the average golfer doesn't break 100. So you're there. Really? Yeah. That's on nine holes, though, brother. I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I guess we'll never play, Drake. <laughs> you right. said the invite was always open brother <laughs> yeah that was to eat oh okay all right all right i'm good at that <laughs> yeah, i think the best part about to me i've always thought about the golfing but it's like driving around in the cart and having the martini isn't that part of it that is part of it see you can come along see i'll you carry you guys golf clubs i'll there be the roadie <laughs> there you go so in one day i broke the head off my driver Borrowed my mom's driver, broke the head off of her driver, and then broke a three wood and never hit the ground. Wow. So I don't, the scariest part of that is that you borrowed your mom's driver. Right. That statement. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that ain't right, man. Sorry, brother. I, I'm secure with my masculinity. Sure, you are. <laughs> yeah. You good? Did you bark? You gonna borrow her shoes next? <laughs> Just because I'm wearing a slip. <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with that. No judgment. <laughs> there you go, brother. <laughs> Robert Lawless wants to know where you went. Robert Lawless wants to know if you ever got to work with Sam Kennison. I did. Sam, oh. uh, first, first time I worked with Sam Kennison, West Palm Beach Comic Cafe, 1987. I walk in the green room. He's got his face buried like Scarface and looks up and he's just got it all over him. Oh, God. Oh, he goes, wow. and goes, you're the clean boy. That's all he said. <laughs> so then fast forward 20 something years later, I see him. Uh, 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 I'm doing Vegas. He's doing Laughlin where he was on his way when he died. But this was, uh, I think, the year before that. And we were on the same plane. And uh, he just looked at me and goes, that clean's worked out for you. That's all he said. Yeah. Yeah. I hung out with Sam quite a bit. He was a character, man. I bet. He was uh, a riot. But at that time, he was, Sam Kennison was like the guy, right? You know, he's the rock yeah. and roll guy and the whole thing, oh, yeah. you know? He was the guy. Yeah. Him and Andrew Dice Clay. Did you get Andrew to Dice with Clay? Clay? He was but yeah, it was really, it was kind of like Kennison, man. Kennison was the guy. Yeah. Kennison, yeah. Kennison was a guy. Dice, Dice was great. And uh, yeah, yeah, I worked with Andrew quite a bit throughout yep. the years. It's got to be odd pairing up because Andrew's obviously not, you know, afraid of vulgarity or profanity in his, in his setup. No, so. Well, you have to understand when I first started doing comedy, I just, 
show up at a comedy club and you're working with who you're working with. Right. Uh, so I was just doing my thing. Now, for the last 15 years, maybe longer, I've been able to control my shows. So my shows are clean beginning to end. Good. All my all my openers are clean. It's really hard to find clean openers because there aren't that many. Yeah. Uh, and, but the young guys who know what they're doing, uh, the guys I have are great. And they've been with me, you know, and they tour with me for, you know, four or five years. And then they end up being headliners on their own and they move on. And then I get other guys. So, but yeah, for the last 15, 20 years, my entire show, when I show up in a town, is clean top to bottom. See, I, I always wanted to try my hand in comedy, but all the good fat white comics die. So I, I've been afraid. You better not. You're better <laughs> off. <laughs> You're better you know, off. That's, you know the thing is with, with comedy too, I mean, even looking at television, I love like Andy Griffith's show. And it's it's one of my favorites, probably my favorite show, especially from that era. And talk about clean comedy. I mean, it's oh, clean, fun. It was I mean, it's genius. Fun. Yeah. It was genius. And every yeah. show that I've developed that has not gotten on the air has been in that vein. You yeah. know, it's, it, everything I pitch is very Andy, Andy Griffith-ish. Cool. Yeah. Though I've heard, I was re hearing recently that behind the scenes, it was not so clean just on TV. I was like, I was pretty shocked. Like, no, not Andy. Yeah. Because the show, show was so, just so well done. So good. Yeah, it was great. It was wholesome and it was really good. Yep. Interesting. Dale Preston wants to know what your golf handicap is. Uh, right now, my index is, I think it's 4-3, something like that. So I've, it's gone up. Yeah, I was a scratch golfer for 15 years, maybe 20. But I just don't put the time in anymore, and it's it's too hard to play that that serious. I You got to practice. I, I don't practice. I just play. Right. There you go. So favorite comedians of today. That's another question. Uh, Eddie Izzard. I think Eddie Eddie's Izzard. brilliant. Um, there's a, he has a special called Dress to Kill, which <laughs> is phenomenal. Uh, you know, that I don't really watch a lot of comedy, uh, but if we're flipping channels and I hear Eddie's voice, I'll tell my wife, hey, that's Eddie, and we'll watch it. Wow. You've had an amazing career, my friend. Oh, it's been a great ride. And I you, hope you, it, you, you were on I the plan Tonight on riding, Show. Tonight Sorry? show, you were, you were on the Tonight Show as well, right? Yes, several times. Uh, I, was oh, supposed to be Johnny, I was supposed to be Johnny's last new guy. Wow. But then he announced his retirement, and everybody started showing up unscheduled, and I got bumped like half a dozen times. Oh. So then Jay told me, well, don't worry. You'll be my first new guy. And I was his first. I was on the first week he took over. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Cool. I love Jay Leno. Jay Leno was great. Of course, being on with Johnny, I mean, that was like, that was the iconic time. Yeah. But I mean, Jay yep. Leno was great. Jay was great. So that's cool. How Jay, cool was that? Jay was great. Yeah. Mr. Carson was very apologetic that uh, it didn't happen. But, you know, I'd be standing there and all of a sudden Clint Eastwood would walk in and I go, oh, OK. Oh, right. there's Bette Midler. There's Bette Midler. Guess who's not going on again? You know? Yeah. Wow. Wow, that is crazy. You got to meet him. You got to be there, though, right? Yeah, that's cool. I mean, it, what can you tell us about that? I mean, who has that experience, right? You know? Right. It was really cool. I was I was backstage no less than six times ready to go and just who's who would walk in. And it was a phenomenal. It's an amazing time. Beautiful. Wow. 1992, baby. Yeah. You had, you had a great 90s. Man, I'm looking through your storied career, and, and I just – you got to write a book, brother. Yeah, I think I'm going to. Somebody else said that because uh, I've been really blessed and I've, 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 I've gotten to do a lot of different things, not just stand up. So uh, there's a lot of cool stuff I could tell. And uh, I think right. that's that's the plan. Cool. Absolutely. Well, I can go on forever, but I, I don't want to keep you any longer. I know you got things going on and I got to hit the road, Jack. I know you do, <laughs> my brother. I know you do. Henry, I, I appreciate you very much for agreeing to come on with us tonight. Hope we can stay in touch. I, I want to learn more about you, and, and uh, I'm going to take you up on that dinner some night. Yeah, dinner, golf, we'll do it all. All right, Mart my brother. Martinis, driver. Martinis, <laughs> you, you drive the cart. You drive the cart. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all cool. right, Henry, thank you so much. Thank you, man. Y'all take care. Thanks. Have a good Thanks. night, brother. Good night.
<laughs> All right, that's Henry Cho, man. He is fantastic. A lot, a lot of different, uh, very different, little, very different to talk to me because he's he's in the same kind of line as what like a musician does, but as a, he's a solo guy. It's just right? wow, very cool, very cool. Yeah, yeah, incredible guy, very gracious, and uh, I, I love to have him on here, man. We we gotta, we have been so blessed, so blessed with the people that we've had on our show and. And we've got a great people coming up. We've got uh, Johnny Elves, otherwise known as Johnny Up Drama, um, comedian, actor, Wahlburgers. He's been in Ted too. He's been in Spencer Confidential. He's a great guy. Uh, we've got him coming up next week, and then we're off for a week. Yep. We're going to take a break for a week. So we got to hear it for Backbeat Music, of course, our sponsors, Media Jaw. Without these people, we can't do what we do. And all of you out there watching and all the, the people that are going to watch this after we post it, um, we can't do this without you. And we love you and, and appreciate what you do. And make sure you get those Hangout Live t-shirts. Um, I think we're down to like 20 left, man. So we we need to get those pumped out there. There's going to be some changes coming up in our show, but we can kind of talk about that. There might be some uh, change of format coming up soon. Yep. So we might be it's switching. going to happen probably almost for sure. But I mean, we're still, we've got guests booked into October and we're booked pretty far out. We've got people that are coming to us now yeah. instead of us calling out of the Rolodex, which is great. You know, that it's, uh, it's starting to pick up steam and uh, I think we're going to get pretty booked and we'll see. Let's see about yeah. the change of format. We'll know more yeah. very so, soon. So if you want to know who's coming up on the show, you can go to the hangout.live. And you can check it out right there. We've got a calendar set out there for you. Plus, you can watch all the videos from the past shows. And uh, remember to bury those inner weapons for peace. And we'll keep moving forward. We love you for listening and hanging out with us tonight. And we'll see you next week with Johnny Drama. It's the Hangout Live with Robbie. And...